Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Mandy Salk. Uh, hello, Mandy. <laughs> hello, Rick. <laughs> um, I interviewed Mandy about two years ago, and um, two years ago, February. And for one thing, there was a technical problem, and her side of the video didn't come through, so I have still shots of Mandy the whole time. This, this time we're going to have an animated Mandy, um, <laughs> the, the real thing. And she, uh, about a couple, few weeks ago, Mandy sent me an email, which uh, kind of really caught my attention. Uh, it's a little long, but if you don't mind, I'll read it. Um, she said, since doing that interview, I had a complete change of position, which caused me to reverse a lot of the things I was saying at the time, and I really want to have a chance to put that right. Because of many awakenings I had, I really believed liberation had happened, and it turned out not to be the case. In fact, sometimes, and in my case, awakenings can hinder any chance of liberation, because you actually stop looking and think you are liberated when you aren't, and then start talking about it too early. At this point in reading the email, I didn't know whether to say hallelujah or nanner nanner. I told you so, because I've been harping on this point for the last three years in these interviews. But, <laughs> but let me continue. Um, the egoic statement, there's nothing that you can do, was what I was saying at the time, because it seemed to be my experience. But then I got deeply into self-inquiry and spent hundreds of hours over months and months in inquiry, meditation, between two to three hours a day. My passion for freedom was like a laser beam of white fire until there was a solid breakthrough. I realized that this is the surefire way of getting to the root of the unchangeable. From this place there is no oscillating, nothing to wear off. But by saying that there's nothing you can do, it keeps the listener imprisoned. It suggests that there can be the spiritual haves and have-nots. But how could that ever be a part of love where no one and nothing is excluded and it is everything. I'm holding my hand up and admitting that I was a typical non-duality teacher who was coming out with some egoic and misguided statements that I have had a complete 360 degree turnaround. Gosh, I even used to criticize the use of self-inquiry which is the only way I began to find real freedom. I'm delighted to say that it has been a, it has had a great response, and I've had loads of emails from people who have genuinely, who are genuinely relieved to hear that a non-duality quote teacher has changed from saying there is nothing you can do, to yes, there is something you can do. And best of all, many have started self-inquiring, which is all I wanted to do. Just gently suggest that they start giving this a go if they have a true desire for knowing themselves. Anyway, should you be happy to give me another interview, then that would be wonderful. Help me spread the word and assist in perhaps opening the bars of the cages of those who are imprisoned into believing there's nothing they can do, unless grace happens to drop in their laps just by chance. I see so many unhappy, depressed people who are lost after going to some non-duality meetings, and I have gotten many emails telling me this. They are made to believe that self-inquiry stirs up the mind and amplifies the personality, when all the time it is really the very opposite. So then they have nothing to do but live in a kind of waiting consciousness. You know what I mean? So that was great, Mandy. Really uh, nice summary. I, you could have said it yourself live rather than me reading the email, but I thought I'd kind of just get it out there and, and then we can discuss this for the next couple of hours if you like. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, um, you know, people have written to me um, in in the past, sort of saying, "Oh, you know, but if I don't have the big car accident or fall off a cliff or, you know, the big awakening, uh, does that mean I'm never going to be, you know, free?" I mean, you know, I, and I always said that, uh, "No, you don't have to have those things to happen. It can just happen." But the, the, there was nothing else to say after that because, you see. These awakenings, I mean, the thing about awakening is they wake you up. That's for sure. But that doesn't mean that you stay in that state, as, as we know. Um, but that can be the real confusion, you see, because it can last a, a while and it can mimic freedom. It can mimic lim liberation. You know, the one where, um, just briefly, where, you know, I did have this motorbike accident and... Uh, and, and and it looked to everybody else like I was dead, but I was sort of going up and up and up, and suddenly I could see through the buildings and see through the people, and and you know realise that nothing was solid, nothing was real as I'd taken it to be. So of course, you know, when I came out of that, and I, and I was completely unharmed after this um, accident, but that stayed um, a long 
time with me because you, you can't forget something like that. However, the abiding in that, it, because this is a strange thing, just because you know it, because you've seen it, um, it doesn't mean that you are immune from the trap of the mind that's going round and round and round. So that's why awakening isn't the same as liberation. It just wakes you up that simply that what you thought and took to be so real isn't real. It, it, it has never been real. But that seeing is, isn't enough. And then, you know, um, I had quite a few more of these awakenings and, and I'd started going to lots of non-duality talks and sessions and it all confirmed everything um, and so this did seem to me my experience because it happened to to me you know I, I thought uh, oh that's it now um, but the sense of joy that one is supposed to feel in liberation wasn't there and also um, th there was quite a lot of egotism you know and I look back at it now and I wouldn't know this if I hadn't started looking through self-inquiry you know you take yourself to be what you think you are at the time so the egotism was that I felt that oh well I, I, I know it all now because I've seen it all there's nothing else to know so, so you stop there um, and then you know and I started talking about it you see and uh, you know did interviews and meetings and stuff and um, you know I, I, I believed completely what, what I was saying <laughs> but um, it, it just came to a sort of a, a, a deadness in me yes that's right and, you know and a lot of people talk about this as, as you know who've gone to lots of non-duality teachers there's a sort of this what there's something feels like it's still missing because the joy isn't there but there's quite a lot of ego there <laughs> you know because you 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 stop looking and maybe you go to a, a non-duality meeting and you sit at the back because you think oh i i don't need to be at the front you know because i know it all <laughs> mm. <laughs> you're not you're not aware that you think like that but actually you know you are thinking like that uh and then um then after a few years a sort of um, uh, like a kind of a, just a dullness set in, a, a depression and the aliveness um, of freedom well I wasn't free, that's, that's the thing you see, it took a lot of unravelling to see it and then um, I think I just watched one Muji video which somebody sort of said oh have you seen this and even at the time they said it to me, there was a, a rising of ego. There was, oh, you know, a, oh, a guru with a funny name. <laughs> thought, oh, no. <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, I'll watch it. And ah, oh, I just couldn't dispute the absolute perfect sense. It resonated all the way through me. And and then I, I just, the, there was this complete, utter, true humility set in because I realized that I, I just didn't know anything and I'd had the arrogance to stop looking this is the thing that I was writing to you about that a lot of non-duality teachers they, they even misunderstand it I mean, the, the, the point of it um, as so did I because I used to knock it I'm embarrassed to say well I'm not embarrassed to say because it's part of what happened but I was embarrassed when I I was embarrassed when I saw it, now I'm not, you know. You know <laughs> I know what you mean. You know, yeah. yeah. We're all but, bozos but, on this bus. Yeah, we're all... <laughs> 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 I like that. That's absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, so so what, you know, you could be a bozo every moment, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, where was... I? Oh, yes. So, anyway, recently, you know, I was watching... Um, uh, 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 anyway, a famous non-duality teacher, uh, and he—he he was sort of like openly knocking and and really almost making a fool of a, a picture of um, Ramana Maharshi that happened to be in that room, and I just—I just kind of thought, oh dear, and and the the, the reason that he had for knocking the whole self-inquiry thing was to say that, you know, well, who's looking? Who's doing the looking, you know? As if in doing the looking, uh, you know, like I said in the letter, 
it amplifies a sense of personality but it's not the personality because there is no personality so how could that be doing the looking you know it's this spark of divine fire yeah. that get, gets brighter and, and it wants it only lives to see itself mm -hmm. um, Mm. Well, like I always say, you know, those, those who knock spiritual practice because they say it amplifies the sense of a practicer should also stop eating because it amplifies the sense of an eater. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> they, they really want to be, be kind of be honest about it. Um, mm. And you know, an effective spiritual practice, and there are many, but one such as you've been engaged in recently. Um, you know, from the outside or just from conceptually one might think, oh, it's just going to reinforce the sense of a doer. But if it's really effective, it does quite the opposite. I think, I think until you look, you, you don't know, you don't see. You, first of all, you've got to see the, 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 through all the layers that you put on yourself that you didn't even know you had, like believing you're liberated when you're not liberated. Mm -hmm you know and you've got to get to a place of fearlessness so that you can really be honest because really like if I, I, I'm being honest with you about you know I had thought that I was liberated and that hadn't been the case but I wouldn't know that if I hadn't looked so first of all it's like in talking to you or anybody that sees this I am I I'm talking to myself you know it's just seeing it for what it is and seeing through the incredible subtlety and the traps of, of the ego that's what the looking mm -hmm. does I mean um, of course there are lots and lots of different practices and over you know my apparent lifetime I've done lots of practices you know I've been a Christian scientist I've been a Buddhist I've been two three different types of Buddhist, uh, <laughs> even trained to be a Buddhist teacher, you know, like Japanese Buddhism, the Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, very nice. I'm not knocking any of it. It was all great, you know, mm -hmm. that's what I was in. And then I was in, I can't remember the other, there's a few different schools of Buddhism. I was in another school of Buddhism. And then, and in that one, actually, the one that I've forgotten, <laughs> I was training to be a teacher. Uh, Must have been I, a very effective one. It just kind of wiped out your memory, you know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did, uh, oh, you know, Vipassana and TM for many years. So I, I, I did quite uh, quite a lot, by no means all, with thousands, but I, I did quite a lot, enough to be able to say, well, I can only say of this perspective, that, that I've never found anything as cutthroat as direct inquiry because you are literally looking back at source, at the substratum of your being, and seeing seeing what it is or who is the seer and who is the seer of that it's going back and back and back and and it takes no prisoners everything is seen everything comes to light there can't be any further lying to yourself um and that's why to me well it's 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 just well great <laughs> you know and 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 since that um it cut through to seeing i mean i did spend a lot and lot of hours at it you know, I I think that um, you have to really, and I know lots of people say it. Maybe some people say the opposite, but all I can say is that unless you, you've got to want it so much, and how you know that you want it that much is because the world falls away. It really does. In that you, you know, you know, you, you're not interested in the, well the next moment. Really, I was going to say things in life like looking forward to events or anything you're just not even bothered because the only moment you know is is this moment and then and then when I talk like this I know it comes back to how people talk when they're non-duality teachers but the truth is the truth no matter how who says it but it's how you sort of get to see that truth that we're really you know tackling I think here mm -hmm. well yeah. I have several comments on all this um you know, before we started recording, you were asking me, you know, how do I keep talking to all these people who are basically <laughs> saying the same thing? Um, but I don't quite see them as all saying the same thing. I I, uh, I feel like each one has a different flavor, and some are quite radically different than others. But um, my attitude, which is why I'm comfortable doing this, is that, you know, as uh, I don't know if this is what he meant by it, but Jesus said, in, in my Father's house there are many mansions. Uh, there, there are so many different... You know, it's like everybody in the world is on a spiritual path, as far as I'm concerned. All seven billion of us, and each one is unique. 
and uh, it's natural for different people to sort of go along different lines and of course there are going to be groups and similarities and so on and so I sort of I find the, the variety interesting that's yeah. one that's one thing uh, another thing is with regard to your self-inquiry thing I w I wouldn't present that necessarily as a universal practice because I don't think everyone is quite ready for it. I think that, and traditionally this is the understanding too, both Shankara and Ramana uh, said that you know you might need to do uh, various other things before getting to the point at which self-inquiry became effective. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's just like you know school or, or, or sports or anything else, you might need to go through certain stages before getting to a certain level of proficiency at which such and such you know, becomes uh, possible for you. Um, go ahead, you were going to respond to that? Well, I was just going to say, well, I couldn't agree more because I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, look at all the things Everything you did. you said, yeah. Yeah, and it's not like you were just fooling around. You, all those things had their influence and, no, and had their, no. their value, mm. you know. I, I, I was completely engaged with them all, you know. Yeah. Uh, One thing so, led to the next. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's all this... Um, talk about whether people should be prepared or not because for some people we all know that we know that for some people not that many but for some people um, the identification with the self has just fallen away in one single thing and it can and off you know and it has been people that have had no spiritual background that they are all. aware of yeah, the, the, well, that they're aware of quite. Yeah. <laughs> they could yeah, have a whole lot of uh, spiritual, yeah. you know, irons in the fire that are finally bearing fruit. Well, I, you see, you're absolutely right there because let's take the, the, the well, the guy that I know, the guy that I met, who, who. Um, I talked about on the last, you know, the guy that was a docker. I was saying I'd met this right. guy that was yeah, a docker. Yeah, listen to that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So, and he was, um, you know, he he drunk a lot and everything, and he said that he was on no spiritual path before. But uh, like you were saying, um, what we term a spiritual path, and and what is also termed the university of life, you know, uh, I mean, like you say, ev every atom, everything in life is a spiritual path it's just that we keep making this delineation between what is spiritual and what isn't spiritual i mean god doesn't even have the word spiritual probably i mean i don't even know what it is anymore yeah. um but i mean his um he he had an amazing uh presence this guy mm -hmm. and and a, and a wonderful way of communicating with people so he he had something that he probably didn't realize he had um, all right, he didn't go on a spiritual uh, journey, but yes, like you say, you know, um, God, which is the eternal mystery, yes, that which we are, but it's so unknown that we don't know all the trillions of ways that there are. So that's why we can't say, you know, this is the best way and it's the only way. Yeah, all, all I was meaning is that for me it was like a, a laser beam of fire of of, of wanting to rid myself of whatever I perceived the self to be and and inquiry was was like a red hot poker just sort of stirring it all up and burning bit yeah. by bit every, every everything that believed it was a mandy you know like something would come up that I thought um, I'd be surprised at and lo lots of things that I'm um, trying to give an example of course, when you want one, there isn't one. <laughs> well, let me, let me respond to that, and maybe you'll think of something. Um, yeah. uh, when I listen to your conscious TV interview, you know, I, I, I kind of put myself in the in the shoes of various listeners, as, as, and I thought, you know, well, some people are going to think, yeah, well, obviously this lady doesn't have to work. She gets to just sort of sit around all day and self-inquire. You know, I'm busy. I've got three kids. I've got a job. You know, and uh, does that mean I'm inferior or something? I, I and and also I don't feel like I have this burning fire of desire. Sure, I'd like it, but I've got a lot on my plate, and uh, and I'm sort of distracted. So, you know, I th I guess my point is that you got to meet people where they are, and um, and what what is feasible or, or effective for one person isn't necessarily going to be for another, and but that's not really it, it's not a really a we're not drawing quality comparisons. It's just, um, we're all, as I say, we're all on the path, and you really can't say that somebody who's all caught up in, 
you know, responsibilities and concerns is less spiritual than somebody who has been dedicating their, their full attention to self inquiry or something. You just don't know. Um, that that person could be light years ahead of you for all you know. Yeah. But um, oh but, yes, yeah, that's <laughs> true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, the whole th- and the whole thing about the fiery <laughs> desire that that yeah. too can be stoked. I mean, maybe somebody's just got a little spark and they don't have the fiery desire. It's not going to suddenly become a conflagration. It's something that can be cultured. You know, you put on a little bit bigger twig and a little bit bigger twig, and then some sticks and then some this. And next thing you know, you do have a big fire going. But one thing does lead to the next. And and so if a person feels like, hey, I'm just a chump. You know, I'm so I'm, I you know I'm so interested in material things, and I'm not ready to be like Mandy who doesn't care about anything else but this don't worry about it you know just do what you can do do what do what you feel motivated to do and you're not going to necessarily end up losing all your possessions and being disinterested and renouncing your children or anything that that's not necessary in order for self-realization to occur I think uh, well th- those things were never necessary you know to, to, to drop those <laughs> those things it, it's it's more like when you when you feel your toes burning near the fire it's more like y- your opinions your judgments your memories um you, and and how you perceive your friendships and th- those things just start to those things start to 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 burn up but i you know i i completely ag- i do agree with you again you know yeah. it's like the, the, the what i mean is that the fire thing that's just been my experience you know yeah. it's it's just been this experience here but um what you know because because people skype me and email me and and they do you know meetings and stuff um i see people who uh, they're there the point is they're there now they some of them might not have very much attention and and sort of find it boring or difficult or whatever but um you know i think that the fact that they're there something's great even if they walk out that's that's fine you know mm-hmm. um it can be stoked because uh well when i started in all my sort of uh, search if you like um i wasn't prepared to spend hours at it at all right. but somehow you know i mean it took years like but <laughs> i got to the place where where uh, it it did became come completely all important um you know so my life my life changed accordingly like um, I don't have children. I love children, by the way, but I just never actually wanted to have children. Uh, <laughs> and so that makes life easier for me as well. People with children, they've got an awful lot to do, but their love and the spirit of who they are and, and, and the, that flame comes from their love. You know, love, it's love really. You don't, you don't have to be sitting for hours, but it, I suppose if you, you get to a place when you're so sick of the identity of of what you are uh, you know what I mean of what you think you are Trapped, that it, yeah. It, it, it yeah it just becomes totally all encompassing but I, it does grow for people because it becomes absolutely addictive and and putting a twig on a fire and another twig is exactly right mm-hmm. if, if people just find they just keep coming back to it i mean there's no time um constraints on it it, could, it there can be awakening to a big chunk of it and then everything's dormant for years maybe and then another chunk happens you know but it definitely does grow but one of the things that um, I suppose all my attention is turned to now is actually teaching um, self-inquiry as, 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 as precisely as you can as you can teach it because a, there's a lot of people um, talk about self-inquiry and give lectures and, and, and stuff but nobody's actually sort of well, there's very few people who's actually saying in concrete ways, what do you do? So, so that's what I'm interested in. That's so, what, when, for instance, when I have, um, when I do a meeting now, r- rather than there be a lot of talk, um, we, we, we just, I, I just, I even just explain that we're just going to have a bit of silence and all I want you to do is just in that silence, see what comes up right now just see what comes up. Are, are you bored are you thinking of the next thing or uh, how long is this going to go on just see what comes up and then you know we do that for a while and then and then we start looking and I just thought to teach them um, self-inquiry because what happens is with self-inquiry and there's so many people talk about it and every, everybody that talks about it to me is wonderful I love what they all say 
but as you can get very confused about which questions to ask yourself. You know, should I be asking, should I be saying, I am, I am? Of course, that's, you know, not it because we don't want to be saying I am. That's like a mantra. It's not, it's just a sense. It's just a sense of that which gets up in the morning, uh, uh, the sense of, you know, the heart beating. It's just pure consciousness, pure existence and getting a sense of that and letting that grow. And then if a question comes up, if a thought comes up, and one teacher sort of said, um, say to yourself, to whom is this thought arising? That's great. If that's what comes up at that moment, that's the, th that's the thought to, that's the thing to, to go with for a second or two and, and let everything come back to silence. Basically, if everything doesn't come back to silence, it just means that um, you've, you've got on a string of thoughts again. So it's it's quite simple, really, because... There's just one easy way to see that <laughs> not progress is being made, but, you, but you're on the right lines if, if you come back to silence each time. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't care if it's a practice or not. It is a practice. You know, this is, it, it, it has, you know, do this and, and you, you'll come back to silence. I mean, silence is the whole thing. It's, 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 it's every, everything you could possibly want. If people ask questions, but if they just gave themselves some silence, <laughs> you know, the questions would be answered. You, you are your own teacher. You are the best teacher. You know, all those answers come from you keeping quiet. Yeah, which I seldom do. Uh, but um, <laughs> no, actually. Um, and when you say that, when you describe that, maybe we could dwell on it a little bit more to reassure people. The average person, almost everyone, you, you and I pr probably as well, when we sit and close our eyes, let's say, to do a practice such as self-inquiry, there are going to be thoughts. You know, you are going to find yourself, tr you know, wandering off on various ideas and thoughts and, you know, both silly and practical and whatever. The mind just has that tendency. And then when you recognize that that has happened, you just come back to the silence, right? Is that what you would say? Yes. The, the, the thing to come back to is the I, even if at first... Sense of I? Well, it, we, we are talking about the sense of I. Right. But at first, you'll probably find yourself thinking the word I, you know. And, and there's, n there's nothing wrong. You see, the thing about self-inquiry... In, in a way, you can't do anything wrong because when you start off, it does take effort. It's like working a muscle that's not been worked at all. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this, and this is what I did. And, and you know, I, I'm sure Ramana Maharshi would say, uh, <laughs> you know, that's wrong. But he, but he would understand because, so, so I was doing that thing where I'd be going, I, and I am. <laughs> and, and then, and then, Eventually, you, you you realize that what you see when you come back to I, even if it's just the thought I, because the I has no content, it brings you to a state of of quiet because I contains nothing. Me is different, you know, or a thought is something that pulls you along like a magnet but when we come back to I even if at first it's the thought I you come back to a quiet place and eventually because you know whoever's talking to you about it whether it's Muji or anybody or me will 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 uh, hopefully <laughs> gently remind you that it's we're talking about the sense of I so mm -hmm. that 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 sense is it's the, the heart beating the breathing going on that the beat you're not beating your own heart the, the heart's beating by itself your breathing's happening by itself you're not doing it you might think you're doing it but you're not doing it. because who are, who are you <laughs> who is who are you to to be doing that so the there's, there's no such thing as a you. So we come back to that sense, or um, Ramana Maharshi would say, this, it's sort of like three, so there's existence, the sense of existence, and that kind of blossoms into consciousness, which eventually becomes bliss, those three, uh, but not really states, so I don't like to say that's how we would describe it. So we come back to that sense of I. What we don't want to be doing 
is this going I, I, and then I am, I am, because then we've got it going like a mantra. Yeah, I mean, if you look at a rose, you don't have to say red, red, red. you know, red, it's red like, you know, you yeah. just it's innocent, it's red, you know, and you don't have, it doesn't have to be the, the thought, R-E-D, you yeah. just see the red, and, you know, <laughs> like that, I mean, yeah, when, absolutely. you know, coming back to a, the sense of I, sense of self, sense of presence, there doesn't have to be any verbiage about it, um, it's just a, everyone has that felt sense, just, you can just recognize that. That's it. People often come back to me and say that they've been saying, I am, I am, I am. And, uh, hey, just keeping the mind busy. Yeah, it's like right. trying to enjoy the rose, saying rose, rose, rose. <laughs> just yeah, relax, enjoy the rose. Uh, that's it, that's it, really. And, uh, you know, that's the thing that I found about mantras, you see. I have to be careful because I don't want to be, I don't want to look like I'm knocking anything, but I have found my own experience that meditations that use mantras they're not you're not looking you're just using a mantra you see so there might be an expansion of, of, of um, silence but we're not just talking here about coming back to silence because self-inquiry you know it takes off more and more layers of the onion well the the, the onion layers aren't going to come off by just being um, nice and comfortably silent but that's what starts to happen first of all we've got to get to know silence we've got to feel comfortable with with silence that's what self inquiry starts to do um and then and then thoughts come all sorts of thoughts uh even good thoughts we don't we don't even want those we don't, we don't want to get drawn by any of these thoughts just like a train going past you know everybody uses this train thing my one is if you imagine little rust trucks i don't know if you have them in the state like like they carry coal you know and they're like rusty trucks that's right um, and I always say that a thought, it's like a poster. You, you know what the thought is at first. Like, um, let's say, oh, they treat, they're treating me just like I was at school. So that the poster is, I'm being treated like I was at school. Now, if you get in the truck with all the rest of it, there's loads more thoughts like how everybody treated you and exactly who was treating you like that and the way that you were treated and suddenly you're back there in the pit of despair covered in the coal dust so when you see the beginning of the thought like like as if it was a poster on the side of a a, a bus or something you just let it go by then the next poster comes you know like oh i wonder if i said the right thing to susie you know, all right, so that's what that poster says. Do we really want to get in that truck with that one? Because then we'd go into, oh, oh, but I, I shouldn't have said that. But then on the other hand, she shouldn't have said that to me. And if she hadn't have said that to me, then I wouldn't have said that to her. Suddenly we're covered in that cold dust. So sure. when, th th this is a, a great way to, to start when we see these thoughts, as well as the question, to whom do these thoughts arise which I'll come back to um, just another thing is that the minute we can get very good at this very quick at this the minute we see the name of a thought imagine it like a poster on the side of a bus then we just drop it like a hot potato and do not get in bed with that thought don't get in the train truck with the thought let it go by treat all thoughts as if they were in Japanese yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That, I like that. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I well, don't know uh, you're interviewing me. You, I should be interviewing you. You come out with some really good ones. <laughs> I love these. Yeah, I'm learning loads here. I'm going to write it all down. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Well, here's a few thoughts based upon what you just said. First of all, you're talking to a guy who's been meditating with a mantra for 45 years. And, uh, <laughs> I'm not knocking it, honestly. Oh, I know, I know. But, um, the, you know, the, your conception of it, even though I know you did TM for a number of years, uh, is, I think, and you may be right, I mean, maybe mantra meditation is preliminary or juvenile or something compared to self-inquiry, I don't know. Uh, but my own experience is that it um, results in the mind settling to a state of quietude, and self-awareness uh, amplifies to the extent that the mind quietens. And in other words, it's like, I don't know, the surface of a, of a pond. If, it's, if the water is all choppy, the sun doesn't reflect very well. But when the water gets really smooth, then the sun reflects perfectly. Uh, so it's sort of a natural consequence of the mind 
uh, becoming silent and yet alert that self-awareness uh, is less and less shrouded uh, by mm, mental activity and eventually is perfectly clear. And through repeated exposure to that or experience of that, just as perhaps you might say repeated exposure uh, with the experience of self inquiry, it kind of gets uh, stabilized and um, you know, perhaps there's physiological change taking place and in any case uh, the, one finds that it's not lost in the midst of activity a anymore. Uh, so you could be riding a bus or you know, doing something dynamic and yet that, that sort of silent self-awareness which was once only accessible in you know, eyes closed meditative states is perpetual. Mm. I think if it's perpetual, that's great. But you see, first of all, I can't compare anything. I mean, like we say, there's so many different ways to, to seeing what you are, and that that's great. Really, I don't have that feeling. That's another thing that thankfully has dropped away with that arrogance, really, of, of um, you know. <laughs> yeah, whatever works, you know, whatever works. <laughs> it is whatever works. Uh, the, only, the only thing that I, I, I would say is that what I noticed about quite a lot of the meditators that, that I knew and it, and it was present in me is that that getting to a point where you're not sort of living in the mind that was sort of happening during meditation but I didn't see it a lot in, peop in their everyday life so I, I met an awful lot of crabby meditators and I, and I know somebody who's been doing it for 50 years who's not like you at all but he's completely <laughs> uptight and never stops yeah. talking and I think you know what's this been doing for him so so I'm afraid I came away from it because I saw a lot of people that yeah they were meditating but I didn't see them sort of living it I suppose what I see more from uh, people that have been doing self inquiry is that it, that it, it because they're they're looking and there's a sort of questioning there's some there's something you know look looking right at what they are and, and then taking off another layer and taking off another layer yeah it's so direct you see is that that affects who you are deeply um, mm. in your normal minute to minute day to day life so that. It's not just while you meditate. It, it just seems to have quick. It seems to have quicker results, you know. Uh, and I don't know if that's true because, like you say, you can't say that because everybody's experience is, is different of it, you know. Well, it very well um, may, you know, and I, I wouldn't dispute that. And, and in fact, I mean, I live in a town where there's three thousand or more people meditating, and right. ma ma many as long as I have been, and. I, I see a lot of people like the one you just described, a lot of people who are just really crazy still and really hung up and, and um, you know, dishonest or argumentative or, you know, uh, fanatical <laughs> one way or the other mm -hmm. and just all sorts of crazy things. And I, I can see myself as having been that way many, many times and during the long periods of my life and so on. For, for me, somehow it crept in at a certain point that I began to question assumptions and to... Uh, not take anything as absolute truth and to um, just have a much more kind of broad-minded perspective and I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how that happened but um, it, in fact I got booted out of the TM movement because I was thinking that way and I was just much too independent in my thinking <laughs> and, uh, so you know I, I kind of resonate with what you say about uh, kind of the self-examination and the um, peeling away of layers of the onion, uh, I think a person can get kind of stuck in a rut um, with any any practice and maybe well, many practices, let's not say any, and get habituated to something that they think is liberating them and whereas in fact they, they really need to shake things up and uh, you know break out of a, a habit that they're not even aware has gotten ingrained. Yeah, yeah. I think so because, you see, I suppose what I find about this is that it's always fresh because, you know, when a, a thought, if a, well, thoughts, what happens is after a while, you know, a, a solid inquiry is that presence takes over and there's like a switch over. Mm -hmm. So instead of there being 
um, a dominance of thought and right. just the little specks of presence. Um, there's, it, there's, presence seems to be the thing, all the, it, the abiding thing all the time, and thoughts are there, but they're more like, um, little fishes just having a little nibble, that they're, they're like vibration, that, yes, they're more like vibration, so that you feel the, the vibration, um, rather than the words, because it's, in that seeing, they, they sort of, um, they, they, they're seen so quickly that they, they kind of obliterate, you know, they disappear, yeah. dissolve in that, mm -hmm. in that seeing, really. So, I mean, I think why I, I love sharing this and, and, and doing this now is because I do see really pretty quick results, really, with people that somehow it does act like a, a knife, even if somebody only has 10 minutes you know, in the morning, ten minutes in the evening. I mean, when I say that they've got to have a fire burning, I, I do think that's that's true. You can't get past that, really. That that, um, but about the fanning of the fire, what what I'm saying is, that even if they just start with ten minutes in the morning or ten minutes in the evening, if they can get to the place um, after a few minutes where the, there's a bit of even a bit of stillness there that is so addictive as you know it's addictive and and you start to want more and more of it and that's how the fire gets fanned really but but i, I would say that you, you've got to wait you know we said before in that last interview you know be still and wait on god because if you're still enough just even if you just give it five or six minutes with with real sort of just just waiting really expectancy we're not talking about waiting for enlightenment or having a delay we're, we're not talking about that it's just you give it a few minutes is all i'm saying and then and then something starts to happen because yeah, that and light, don't don't be looking for some big dramatic breakthrough just yeah be, yeah be, definitely yeah, not. just be easy about it that's it and um and, and, and not worrying at all as you, as, yeah. as you know with any meditation whether thoughts come up or not in fact great if they do because you know it it it, it becomes uh, the, the thoughts that that come up. I mean, in self inquiry, as soon as you notice it, it you sort of there's there's many different ways of dealing it. You know, you know, you can sort of flick it off like a mosquito, or or look at it. If it's something that's biting at you, like some something that's happened with somebody and it needs looking at, what I always say is just. Okay, give, look at the situation for one second. Don't give yourself more than one second. Just feel the vibration of where it is in your body. Where, where, where's it biting you? In your neck, you know, in your throat, in your heart, in your head. And just get right into it. Not into the words, but just really feel it. So allow yourself to feel it so much that you're vibrating with it. Your whole body's shaking with it. <laughs> And then just sit with it, sit with it. And even if it's a sort of really ugly sort of thing, just sit with it. And because in a few seconds it just dissolves. And unless you've done it, you don't you don't see it. But it always works. You know, it just does work. You just you just have to give it a few seconds. And then we come back to that sense of I am, just that sense of it, or I. And th there's a stillness because once again, you know, the I has no content. It knows nothing of that argument you've had with, with so and so. It doesn't store anything. There's no judgments there. When we get near to, to the edge, it's like when you've been doing this a, a, a while, um, the, bur there's, there can be a burning sense. You, you can even be getting very hot when you, when you're doing the contemplation. And, as a fear can come up and it, it's a fear of losing all those things that you think you are which we said at the beginning things like your memories or thoughts or words and, 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 and it will get you at your weakest point see it's, it's like all these thoughts <laughs> or mind really knows where to get you by the jugular so I'll give you an example um one of my greatest fears was going, um, what's the word, uh, premature senile dementia. Mm -hmm. Yes, because when I was a young girl, um, I had an absolutely favorite uncle. Um, yes, Uncle Max. And he was, an, um, a, he was quite young and, and he was uh, handsome and he was very funny and he was always totally lovely to me, an incredibly intelligent guy. So, you know, we had some great conversations and I loved him. And I used to see him from time to time. 
Anyway, one day, um, there were, my parents had a party, and, and he was sat there in the corner, and he was sat on his own, you know, and he just looked a bit strange. And I went to speak to him, and he, and he looked right through me, and, and it suddenly felt very frightening. Uh, and I don't know, I must have been about uh, eight or nine. So I went to my mum, and she explained that he had this state called premature senile dementia, and he was like only like 38. Mm. Um, and it was shocking, really, to see it. And it took a lot of explaining. And, and, I, and, and, then, and then as I got older, this became a real fear for me, that this could happen, that you could lose your mind, you see. And uh, I, I got, you know how when you're scared of something, you watch everything there is to watch on it. So documentaries, any movies that anybody made about somebody who'd gone senile or anything. Oh, you know, I was there. As if, as if by watching it, I'd think, oh, you know, I better watch it so it won't happen to me. You know, the kind of way that we do these things. Anyway, um, one of the sort of, um, so, I don't know if you, kind of awakening things was that uh, one one night um, I suddenly was aware that I just didn't know anything. I, I, I didn't know anything. And I thought, and I thought, oh my goodness, now, what is the test that the doctor would give you if you don't know something? Oh yes, the first thing they'd say is, do you know what country you're in? Do you know what year it is? Do you know who, well, in our country, the Prime Minister is? Um, and so I was racking my brains. I thought, right, the Prime Minister, the Prime, what's the name of the Prime Minister? And for an hour or two, I couldn't remember it. My mind was absolutely blank. And I got terrified because I thought I was going senile, you see. And, um, and eventually I remembered it. And I was so happy that I remembered it. But then later on, I was horrified that I was horrified because I'd realized this is one of my opportunities, I thought. You know, I could have jumped then. It was about, this is about losing everything. You know, but it doesn't mean that you lose your ability to facilitate your life. You know, it, it's not about that. It's not about dementia. It's no. a different kind of sort of not knowing it. It and and so when you get near the fire, what you know what I mean by the fire? The fire of burning you up, your identity up. Uh, things could happen, so something will get picked on. So that wasn't the thing that got picked on for me. Mm. Uh, and other people have other things that get picked on. And, and suddenly it comes up, and you don't realize it until afterwards. Oh, that's what it was. It was like Jesus on the mountaintop being tempted, or, you know, that's what it was. And I didn't see it for what it was. So then what happens? Later on, maybe something else will happen. Another fear will come up. And then... And then you think, oh, God, that was another time. That's what it was. And eventually what happens is your fears <laughs> sort of dry up. And, and there's a, real, a realization that nothing can really frighten you, actually, you know. And so it doesn't have to be a big, oh, you're falling down a black hole like some people have experienced. And it's absolutely terrifying. And then you realize it really can be a gradual thing. Have I knocked something? You knocked your microphone up to your oh. forehead, so you bring, <laughs> bring, it, bring it down there. There you go. <laughs> there we are. Actually, keep it down near your neck. That's better. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Did you hear that? Though? Yeah, we heard it all, but it, it just got a little yeah. hollow there. Well, that, there's a lot to think about there. There's a lot of good stuff you said. Um, uh, you know, you kind of started out by talking about the fact that presence can get the upper hand over thoughts, you know, and uh, that for the most pe for most people, thoughts have the upper hand and, and, you know, their perceptions and their opinions and their attitudes and everything else, that's how they define themselves, you know. Um, but turning that around, there, and presence is pretty much in, in the background, overshadowed, but there can come a time through kind of practice you're talking about where uh, presence gets the upper hand and that that becomes predominant and the thoughts as you say are like little fishes um, and I, I see it very much that way there's like this seesaw or ratio kind of thing where um, you know f for the most part people are very much overshadowed gripped and then you know presence can begin to shift the balance and, and eventually become predominant and, and and there are you know as you said earlier awakenings stages in that in that process it's not necessarily a smooth 
uh, transition, there can be little jumps and milestones and, and whatnot. Okay. Or, and some of those milestones, as we started out saying in this conversation, can be mistaken for the final destination. You know, you, there's this, some awakening takes place and you think, that's it, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but in my opinion, nobody's done, ever. Uh, it's, this is just an opinion. I may be wrong, but in fact, I was reading St. Teresa of Avila. I read a quote by her the other day. She said, "The feeling remains that God is on the journey too." You know, so not only are not we and are we not done, but God is not done. There's every the whole universe is a big evolution machine, and no matter how uh, far along you are on the whole scale of evolution, whatever that scale may be, uh, you ain't reached the end of it because there is no end. <laughs> Yeah, because really, that more than knowing what you are, the, 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 the biggest thing is knowing what you are not. Mm -hmm. So, knowing, you know, knowing that you aren't your thoughts, you aren't your opinions, you aren't your judgment, you, you your essential you isn't any of that. And that um, has, it gets more and more subtle and more and more refined. And, you know, I, I wouldn't trust anybody. I don't, I don't think there's anybody alive on the earth, anybody being on the earth <laughs> that will ever say that this ends. Um, what happens is, is certainly, um, I suppose, what you, you know, from doing it, what's the benefit? I suppose what you could uh, see, say is that there's definitely an expansion of this presence so that, that there's more abiding in it. There's um, what, and, and, and that whatever is taking place is okay, so there's not like panic and reaction around it anymore. It's just what's taking place. Um, there's, there's th that idea of looking forward to something, something good, like you know, some celebration or looking so, that that goes, you know, um, and and that's a lovely thing. It's an alive thing, not a dead thing, because um, there's nothing better than this moment now. Yeah. So th these things happen, but um, what goes on happening is that you you can't possibly know what's going to happen next so you can't possibly know um you know how that thing's going to affect you really i mean it's not that because there's not a sense of a you or or you know there's no sense of a me in in the way that it used to be when there was a sense of a you know a very strong sense of me it, well, you you kind of can be pretty sure that most things, you know, it will just be absorbed in it, and you'll deal with it um, the the way it is. What but what what I mean is like for instance, um, the other week I was actually just going to give um do a meeting, and a car cut right across in front of me. Um, on, a, on one of the busiest roundabouts we've got here, and um. I, honestly, I, I was a hair's breadth away from from physical death, and uh, you know, and and uh, the man was sort of very arrogant and frightening in the way that he was driving as as he progressed down the road, you know, and frightening everybody on on the freeway kind of thing. Highway. And um, anyway, the moment that it happened, um, wow, fury just like you, you know, you stupid, <laughs> you know, yeah. that that came up for a second. But I think what what I mean is where before that would sort of hang on for a few seconds, a few minutes, a few hours and go bump, 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 bump and be some light vibration it's just dropped like a man with his coat on fire it, it's just dropped and then there's nothing less, even though I have to continue driving the, down the road with him on the side mm -hmm. um, it was just dropped um, I, I was explaining this in, in the meeting because it was the meeting you know that I nearly died and didn't get to <laughs> And a lady at the back, she's so sweet, and she said, and she she said, I'm a Christian, and and you know what we would sort of say is that if somebody does something like that to us, we would immediately try and switch it to sending him a blessing, and I sort of said, oh, that's really lovely. That's not quite what I'm talking about because, in 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 the seeing of what you are, which is not a see, it's not oh, I, I'm seeing what I am. Obviously, it's just I am in, in the seeing. There's a, there's there's such a seeing that when people live in their minds, that's how it is. You, you don't think to yourself that's because he's living in his mind. There's just a that's one thing there is a knowing of that people, if they're not seeing this, they are living in their mind and they've got to be there first. I mean, it's like 
you are sitting in something much bigger than you. It's like it's like you are sitting as a passenger, in not not as a passenger, sorry, as the driver, and you're in the front seat. And you're always in first trying to lunge forward. And you've never ever looked behind you. You've never seen that there's huge big, the, the car's massive behind you, you know. And you were never the driver. And there's no place to go anyway. <laughs> and you're not going anywhere. Um, so the, it, it, there's a settling into it. And there's such a compassion that we don't need to put effort into thinking, oh, I'll send this man a blessing. It's just blessed by our lack of reacting to it by our by our harmlessness he is blessed because there's an open space for him and his being the way that he is exactly the way that he is yeah and sending him a blessing might also work for that woman i mean because if, exactly. she, if she's not functioning in the mode that you're describing then that might be really the best thing for her to defuse the anger that she felt you know when she got cut off um, but 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 we, we, because she'd come to the meeting, she was asking about that very thing, so she true. was open to it. And yeah. and and the thing that she agreed with is that I I, I used to go down that road you route because I used to want to be an angel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I used to watch Harvey with Jimmy Stewart. You know that. Oh uh, yeah, I love that. Yeah. I I always wanted to be um, well. He's not Harvey. Elwood P. Elwood P. Dowd, I think he was called. <laughs> Elwood P. Something or other. The man, James uh, James Stewart. I always wanted to be him, so lovely to everybody, just so nice, you know. And, uh -huh. and, then, and then, of course, every time I wasn't nice, I would berate myself, and it made me have a stronger sense of the self, this wanting to be a nice person. Yeah. It, it makes you actually more objectionable to yourself because you can never, you can never um, raise to your own standards. You set them too high. So let's say somebody, you are that person who believes that you want to be a good person. And somebody cuts you up and you think, and you're, you're angry, yes, for a second. And you think, oh, no, I must make this into a blessing. Well, later on in the day, maybe you spill some milk at the wrong time or something happens. And you're suddenly angry that you blessed that person because actually now you're feeling angry towards him. And then you have to remember again and you think, oh, hang on. Uh, no, no, let me bless him again. But I'll bless him again. Do you see what I mean? There's so much yeah. effort in trying I know to what you be mean. Yeah. a good person. Yeah. <laughs> and that's uh, what we were talking about then. <laughs> but it might yeah. still be better than trying to than than just letting yourself be a schmuck, you know. I mean, if yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> it could have some sort of <laughs> some sort of counterbalancing influence. Yeah, but but you know this better. the things you were just describing kind of play into the general theme we've been talking about in the last little bit, which is this thing of predominance of presence versus presence being you know over overwhelmed or overshadowed. And I think what you're talking about is a kind of a style of functioning that naturally arises from, or that naturally occurs in a person for whom presence is quite predominant. You know, there's a, a natural sort of um, unattachment uh, or a, a natural spontaneity. And in, well, just to make it more graphic, in the Indian tradition, they use this analogy of like drawing a line on stone, you know, with something, scraping it into a stone, and then the line is very etched and it doesn't go away. And then maybe a line on sand, you know, it's easier to draw and it um, goes away fairly quickly. Or a line on water, even easier to draw and it goes away even faster. Or just a line on air, you know, it's like totally effortless to draw and phew, it's just gone as soon as it's drawn. So, you know, you can think of that, compare that with various degrees of rigidity with which people function. And some are, you know, if they're very locked into the front seat of that giant car you were talking about, you know, very locked into an individuality, there tends to be that kind of uh, impressionableness so that when something happens, it creates a deep impression which they might dwell on for months or years or something. Oh, that. SOB cut me off in traffic, and every time I see a blue car, I think of that guy, you know, who was driving a blue car. Yeah, whereas, to, to, to jump to the other extreme, which was your experience, uh, the thing happens, and it's pretty much, you know, there's an initial reaction. There is a line in the air that, that's drawn, but as soon as it's drawn, it's gone. And also, um, you, you know, somebody wrote to me just earlier, actually, about, you know, what what happens when you get angry with this and angry with that and I actually just sensed from the email that this guy was very angry a lot of the time you know uh, and uh, I sort of um, you know I think I think the point about that is that 
you stop minding about minding. It's not just that you get to a state of you don't mind so much because you, you really do through inquiry. I don't. I, this is this is the thing I want to keep coming back to that. For me, you know, when I, for 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 this being inquiry being great because it's so, it's it's for everybody. Everybody can do it yeah. if they want if they want to do it and 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 have the same results. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if because because um, it it takes uh, what does it? Well, it just takes a love of truth and honesty and a, and a kind of humility to sort of want to scrape away that ego anyway i mean if you're really loving your ego and egotistic you wouldn't you wouldn't want to touch it with a barge pole would you so <laughs> so so the, the more that you scrape away at it the the, the more um you, you know the more garbage goes and the lighter things become so there is much more of a, a state of not minding stuff but even if you did mind something you wouldn't mind that you minded it so and there's enormous freedom in that rather than feeling like a bad person or a guilty person because that happened to be you become so able to um be self forgiving because there's no self to forgive it's just it's just it's seen when thoughts are bought into for a second and that's what happens you know when you get angry annoyed or you have a judgment but there's no judgment about it whereas when you're trying to be a good person you always have a judgment about how well you've done um, and um, all the suffering that happens is really because our divine nature our true nature is benign so when we start acting out of character I mean let's say people who aren't on a spiritual path at all and they, they drink too much if you like and and they're angry and violent and what have you um, it it just gets perpetuated because they think they're not good enough so I mean you know somebody that I heard of went into a jail and um, talked to some of the, the guys there about this kind of thing and just kept saying you are good enough you are good enough it, 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 not even good enough but you are good you're totally good and some of them couldn't handle it at all but one guy had been the most violent in, in, in the prison just came up to this teacher and sort of said am i am i really and he went you are you are and some sometimes we need a lot of reminding of that well we need reminding of it the whole time really and that's why ramana mahashi said you have to be vigilant to your last breath mm -hmm. so this is going back to as somebody you were saying that um it's never finished you know it, it's um but but it gets easier but on the other hand it wouldn't get easier if you had the lack of humility to think that it was finished you see a lot of non-duality teachers say things like oh it's all over it's all over then for me it was all over <laughs> well you know that's a load of yeah <laughs> I, I agree I mean I, whenever anybody says that to me and they, I hear that too I, I think yeah, you, well, you, you'll just wait and see, I won't you? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, I've had people send me emails saying I'm totally awake. There couldn't possibly oh, be anything. And, and in fact, I even in a number of interviews I've I've asked towards the end of the interview, I think, well, you know, where? Well, what do you think's next? Where do you see it going from here? What's on the horizon? You know, how do you? How has your growth been? And they say, and some people say, what growth? You know, how could there be anything more? And I think what that what happens with that is there's a sort of a fixation on the absolute which is seen to be non-changing and uh, to the exclusion or to the neglect of the relative which is ever-changing and ever uh, improving there's no there's no end to the extent to which uh, refinement can take place in in the in the, the relative sphere and you know like our friends uh, Scott Kilby and Jeff Foster and all they've all kind of come to this position too whereas at one time they were sort of fundamentalist non dualists <laughs> uh, now they're kind of like interested in you know, relationships and uh, you know all sorts of relative considerations and how to bring non duality to the sphere of, of relative human concerns as a means of enhancing them in fact, Scott and I and a bunch of other people are going to have a discussion in January about um, psychology and non-duality and, and what the um, benefit for psychology may be from non-dual realization. I think it's just, 
um, you know, welcoming everything, embracing everything that's in life. I mean, you see, because, um, yes, when you fix on the absolute, of course the absolute's non-changing, and that's what we're coming back to when we talk about silence, you know. Are you, are you all right? You hear? Sorry, I just... Yeah, you're good. Um, yeah, um, yeah, well, we talk about silence, and, and you know, that that's the source of everything, the source of our action, the source of everything. Um, and that's... Um, you know, beautiful, and then there's the seer of, of that, and who's looking at that. But, um, you know, there's no deadness in that. It's no. fully alive and, 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 and absolute spontaneity all the time. I mean, it's amazing. You just be, you're amazed at everything all the time. And there was somebody that you had on here recently who said that, and then, and then there's an, even another stage when you're not amazed at everything all the time. Well, actually, uh, you know, no, that I can't agree with that. Can't relate to that. <laughs> yeah, huh? yeah. You, you know, because um, the the absolute beauty of it is is that there's a sort of a staying awake. It, you know, I mean, liberation is about staying awake, and liberation isn't something that you see. You see, when we say we are free now, that's a very that. I mean, that you are free now. Everybody that is listening to this is free now. You are not a seeker. You are, because you, when we look, we find we're actually not a seeker because you, your thoughts will never be free, free. But by their very nature, thoughts are thoughts, aren't they? So how can thoughts be free? They are thoughts, and, and they all link together like glue, bonding together. But underneath all that, what you are is free now. So... In that freedom. <laughs> yeah, but the operant <laughs> phrase, the operant phrase is underneath all that, because you know, for many people, all that can be so overwhelming that it's very hard to sense the freedom. You know, yes. that, that yes. it's a, okay. and so the, the 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 trick is to lighten the load that's overshadowing the inner freedom, so that the inner freedom can shine forth. Yes, it it is, but sometimes there can be just a <laughs> a seeing that that. Oh my God! I've always been free. Of course, I'm free. Yeah. That that which you know is is free. Now, uh, but in freedom, anything, <laughs> everything is free to happen as well. So mm -hmm. you know, Jeff was uh, well with Jeff. Jeff Foster. He, he, he's a really good friend of mine because his folks don't live far from me. So when he comes to see them as well, you know, sometimes he'll pop up. Or when he stayed, uh, when we, when I used to have non-duality north, he'd stay. He stayed a few weeks ago. We had, and, and before he stayed, I, you know, rather sheepishly <laughs> wrote to him and sort of said, you know, I've changed everything about the way that I used to see this. And he said, and he wrote back and said, you know, I have too. Oh, <laughs> I know, yeah. A great, great discussion about it. And um, it's, it's, but it, it's just coming back to the, the, in the freedom, it's seen that everything that happens is completely, exactly, well, exactly perfect the way it is meant to be. So it is that old Zen thing that you hear over and before, before enlightenment. But we're not talking about enlightenment. If we get rid of the word enlightenment, liberation, even freedom, that, that it's just that those words, they're so loaded, aren't they? They are, but you know they they do actually signify something, and we yeah. we have to use words, but we want to make sure that we're using them carefully, so that you know we're not saying one thing and people are hearing and, or assuming another. You know, we want to know what what we mean when we use the terms. It, I think I think what I'm trying to say is that if people see it as an end thing, that, that yeah. there's no there's no end result. Some you know. static glorious carrot that I'm finally going to catch, even though it continues to dangle you know, in front of me, <laughs> yes. no matter how far I go. Absolutely, but when and certainly when I used to hear people say, "Oh, it's all over," that's how it used to seem like that. You know, this sort of, it, well, well, really a dead end. And, yeah. and people sort of saying, oh, I don't know how to talk to my partner anymore because they don't see things the way that I do. And every mm -hmm. single conversation with anybody is absolutely lush. Do you have that word in the middle? Lush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it has two connotations. One is it's somebody who drinks too much, and the other is very verdant and abundant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lush is gorgeous. It's gorgeous. You know, it doesn't matter if they're talking about Windeline or whatever. You know, it's the fact yeah. they want to talk to you. Yeah. Let's play around with another little topic for a bit. Um, you said a little while ago there is no such thing as I, and um, I was reading the book of uh, someone whom I'm going to interview in a few weeks, and in, in that she was saying there are no persons, 
And um, I understand what you're saying, what she's saying, but I'd like to play devil's advocate for, with it just for a little bit and see what you think. Um, and what I would say is that on on and you know I, I I use the word levels a lot, and some people say, why do you say that? Because there are no levels. You know, it's all just one wholeness, and that's true also. But there's always this paradoxical yes, but, you know, that you can do whenever you make any kind of statement. So there are, there, first there is no mountain, then there is, the, first there is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then there is. There are, there are no levels, yet there are levels. Uh, the physicist would tell you that, that, you know, ultimately it's all just the vacuum quantum field or something, but then there are all these, you know, more manifest levels, uh, which again, you can take right back down to the unmanifest and say, well, they don't really exist, they're just virtual, they just appear to exist. Um, I'm getting a little long-winded here, but I'll, I'll try to wrap it up. So when a person says there is no I, uh, I can totally agree with that, um, both you know intellectually and in, in my own experience. But at the same time, there is an I, uh, and it may be you know ultimately not real, but it's at least functional and necessary in order to live a life. Um, and it seems as, as kind of meaningless to me to make to stay with any absolute finality that there is no I as to say there is no body. I mean, if you're going to deny the existence of the, the subtler realms of, of manifestation, why not include the gross as well and just say there is no universe? <laughs> so you know what I'm getting at? It's, it's like you have to, to really sort of play the game of, of spanning the whole strata of creation even while acknowledging that the, the, the more manifest levels ultimately are not real, but in a, in a relative sense, they are. Well, you know, we're having a human experience. There's no doubt that we're having a human experience. Right. Um, you know, we, we have senses and we can taste and smell and, and uh, we have preferences, you know. Um, and we, but those preferences, uh, let's just take that one for a minute, um, are different from judgments because uh, the mind, uh, well, thoughts uh, always come in and make judgments about this is good, this is bad. They're like window wipers, good, bad, good, bad, comparing everything. Whereas a preference is just a noticing um, that you like this flavor better than that person, flavor, or even this person better than that person. Not better than, but just like pref you prefer to be in that person's company than that person's company. Not that there's any judgment in it. And so, like, let me give you an example to see if I understand what you're saying. So, like, we just had a lot of rain here for the first time in a long time, mm -hmm. and, and that was great. Uh, I would rather it had been colder and we'd had a nice snowstorm so I could go out skiing. But, All right. Uh, but, uh, so that would be my preference, but I wouldn't say the rain is bad and snow is good, which would be a judgment. Exactly. That's exactly right, you okay. know. So, and, it, and it's... Um, it's nice and light to be free of judgments, you know. Yeah. Though this okay. is I mean, my mother, every time it rains, she'll say, oh, it's miserable, she'd say. It's miserable weather. Yeah, I know what and you I, mean. <laughs> and I used to say, it's raining. You know, yeah. I haven't anything else to say. It's raining, that's all. <laughs> so that sense of I is um, it's just made so big with, this, with judgment, really. You know, this is what... This is what um, goes when we do self-inquiry. You know that I'm somebody that doesn't like the rain, but but I like the wind, or I don't like the snow, but I like the. You, you know what I mean? It, it arguing with what is, yeah, arguing with reality. So that sense of um, me as a person. So the whole point of inquiry is that every time that you think that you are a person, you look at that to try and find where you are. And it's just that you can never find you. There, there isn't right. a sense of you. There, there just isn't. There's no concrete. There, there isn't. There's. Um, and then you know when when you are seeing that, it's like you 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 feel basically so loved and nurtured and looked after by well that which you are, or you could call it presence or God. It's the presence of love. So every time you, you, you know, you're putting your coat on or brushing your teeth or whatever you're doing, because there's no sense of a doer. Well, who uh, is this it, that's feeling loved and, and cared for and nurtured? Well, exactly. Well, well. It, and by whom? Love. There, there, is, there, is there some kind of the lover and some kind of lovey here? I mean, who is it that's getting cared for if there's no do, no no I, no person? Wow, well, let's sort of take brushing your teeth is always a good one because we all do it. Um, when 
when brushing the teeth is happening, but mm -hmm. there's no sense of, oh, I'm doing that. I, I am, um, you know, um, somebody's turned me on and my joints are all working and I'm doing it. When there's not that sense, oh, there's, there's just a sense of, um, nurturing and love but not that anybody's feeling it. it it's just felt that's all there is it's that's that's why every little action every little thing now matter how insignificant become that's what the aliveness is you see rick that's what the aliveness is that that everything that's mundane is no longer mundane so it's the ordinary within the extraordinary do you know what i mean that's that's what it is yeah i know what you uh, mean um but there's, there's still a sense of localization to me it's like when i'm brushing my teeth i'm not brushing your teeth you know i'm i'm brushing these teeth but, the rick archer teeth and and there's still a sense of and maybe this will totally go away but there's a sense of you know i, I get the universal aspect thing uh you know and and that's that's quite predominant but there's there's still a sense of localization which i find to be practical and necessary and i don't think i don't know but i don't think that that ever completely goes away in fact in in sanskrit there's this term lesha vidya which means faint remains of ignorance and the understanding is that as long as you're breathing there's going to be a faint remains of ignorance which gives one a sense of some sense of individuation, however, uh, however uh, slight, which is absolutely essential for functioning as a human being. Well, that's maybe what they say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I just try to put it in. You see, when we're talking about these things. Um, it's it this is the this is where it gets difficult to sort of put it into words because you're quite right i'm i'm listening to what you're saying but my own experience i suppose which is sort of deepening and i say not not done just deepening is that that heavy sense of a person of a doer is just it's thinner and thinner and th thinner. You know what I mean? It's, it's exactly. More no, like, that's that's just like, what I was saying. Yeah. I mean, faint remains of ignorance. Faint you know, remains. Leisha, yeah. Leisha. Yeah. Just a faint remains. So, mm -hmm. but it's never going to disappear entirely if you intend to keep on f living. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> the, probably. It, it may be just a, <laughs> a you know a thin crust on a vast ocean, but there's but, still there's still going to be some faint remains. But because it's thin. Um, it's it, no longer it, predominant. It, no, it's not sort of noticed as much. That's why I have to sort of think about it. Yeah, it's not it, running the uh, show. No. I mean, um, if you've got physical pain, if, if you have um, physical pain. I had some physical pain last night. Now, why was that? See, well, I you, you, you mentioned last time I spoke with you that you might have to have a hip replacement surgery or something. That, oh, yeah. That, having, that must have involved some pain. Oh, that's painful. That That was in April. But um, this was to do with, anyway, what we call I didn't, heartburn. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you call it heartburn? Yeah, we do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, that was really vicious last night. And then, in, but in the viciousness of it, it, it takes on a different kind of energy so that it's, 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 co it's completely all-encompassing, almost like a, a color and a vibration, but not like it's belonging to a person it's mm. it's there and it was bloody uncomfortable but it didn't feel owned does that help it yeah owned. rather than before it rather but it was happening like but there was a sense time. that the experience was not the same as if your dog had had been the one with the heartburn there was a there was a sort of a and and you know, and I wasn't experiencing it. There was, in other words, in the, the sort of manifestation of life we call Mandy, that's where heartburn experience was taking place. Yes. You know? The difference is it, it, it didn't feel, um, it, it would have before felt like a personal pain, like I owned it, um, it belonged to me. No, it doesn't feel like it's over there, or right. it, uh, if only it could. <laughs> you know, but in, in, in the light of the seeing of of that it that's all was going on it it 
it um well it just doesn't bother you quite in the same right. way <laughs> because it's not the totality of your experience as it once might have been it's it's, it's just sort of a something that's happening on the surface of a much deeper uh, re orientation, much deeper reality. There was a story about Shankara, the, the great teacher years ago, you know, a couple centuries ago, founded Advaita. He had a high fever at one time, and he was shaking with fever. And he was supposed to meet some important person who had come a long way to see him or something, and but he couldn't meet in that condition. So he put the fever on a, 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 a stool that was in the room, and the, when I met with a person, the, the, the stool shook. And then when the meeting was over, he took it back and he started <laughs> start shaking again. And his disciples said, why did you just leave it on the stool? And he said, well, because, you know, there is some individual karma here still that has to be worked out, and I couldn't shirk it you know I had to had to ha, had to live through it <laughs> oh I wouldn't have bothered with that I'd have left it on the stool <laughs> not bothered about karma <laughs> I not believe in that but uh, yeah I like that story that, oh, oh, the, the psychologist Gestalt used to teach that didn't he put your stomach ache or, or bad knee or bad back on a, on a chair you oh, know and, yeah. and talk to it he did yeah mm. but um yeah, I mean, another example. Actually, I hope you don't mind, because I gave this example in, I that don't mind at all. No, fine. in that last interview. Well, it was just that I, I, I was telling you that I was driving along a very windy highway at night, and um, because this is like that other story of the heartburn, um, and it what the car, which a very little car I had, and it was being blown from side to side, you know, and um, and now you see. It was noticed that this was terrifying. Now, I, I, I'm so sorry, it sounds very non-duality sort of thing, but I, I it, it, it wasn't that me, I personally I'm terrified. was, yeah, it was as though there was terror all around. And if I could describe it, it was like being, in, it, if, if I could draw it, it would look like I was sat in the middle of a whirlpool. But this whirlpool didn't touch me, it was just around me. So that fear was solidly there but wasn't sort of touching me like standing by a fire and not actually being but not being the fire you know being being with the terror but not being terrified being with the heartburn but not having heartburn so that you see there comes to a point when unfortunately you can't make any more sense than that really yeah <laughs> Well, it makes sense. It makes sense to me. Something. Just even as you said, it makes sense. And yeah. and what I would come back to you with is, you know, a little bit of a new agey way of speaking. But that we're we're multidimensional beings, and ordinarily people are locked into the superficial dimensions only, and those seem like the totality of what they are and what is happening to them. So there's I am terrified because my their whole sense of identity is caught up on sort of the the surface level of life. But when when you've kind of opened up to the full range of all the dimensions <laughs> that your life spans, and you, and you've come to pre predominantly orient yourself or be identify with the the deeper level, the presence or whatever we want to call it, then as just as you described, there's terror, but it's not my terror. It's not happening to me because the me that you're referring to here, so to speak, is firstly not personal, and secondly far beyond the realm at which. You know, terror or or heartburn or anything else could be experienced. It's it's untouched by all that. Yeah, I think I think I just want to sort of really I think it's important this point of that you are addressing of 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 being here and you know living a human experience mm -hmm. because um, you see people get very either worried about it or or jealous about the idea that somebody's got something that they haven't got uh, you know and, and ego comes right into it so that's why it's um, always a tricky one to talk about truth it's a bit of a minefield all you, all you can really say is what's is what's going on you know um, my my you see my experience of having you know i've just really spent hundreds and hundreds of hours and 
even now, I mean, I love it, you see. So I, st- I still do it. I probably always do it. You know, it's like the bodyguard of the being. It's sort of like, you know, I mean, I, I think I do about three hours a day. Now, I'm not saying that to show off because, you know, I don't need to do it, nor does anybody need to do it. Nobody needs to do it three hours a day. It's just my pleasure. And like you said earlier, I haven't got children. I haven't got a busy life, you know. Um, so I can, you know. And yeah, it's why not? Just my, so that, exactly. Um, and As the saying goes, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. Exactly. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, so I just like, you know, basking in that presence. Yeah, I totally and then relate. If question, if you know, if something comes up, um, you know, it's questioned. But, but now I suppose it's got to the point where it's just seen through. It doesn't hardly need a question. Do you see? Do you see? That's the way self inquiry works. Yeah. It's not be- Mandy Salt being special. It's the way that it, it works. If you haven't got three hours a day to spend at it, it, it doesn't mean that it can't work. Of course, it can. It can still work. It's it's a that the underlying thing is starting to, is questioning what you think of as you so this really strong sense of i being the doer of my life and being here really does it does evaporate it doesn't it does. feel like there is a person here of course you know you can see one i can see one but the feeling of being inside this um you know really lessons and lessons and lessons you see yeah. Um, I know you were talking about stages, and I've, there's all sorts of things. Different prophets say things about. Well, first of all, you start in this stage, and then you start. Um, sometimes I think that's right, and sometimes I think it's not quite accurate because nobody could really say what the stage is for another person. You know, if they're at the same, if like, are you at stage three? Should you be at stage three? You know what I mean. <laughs> Um, well, it's like roadmaps, you know, and, and there are different roadmaps you can buy, and and they may kind of, you know, resemble one another. And the the roadmap or the map of North America that Columbus drew looks very different than the, the map we see now, but there's some resemblance and so on. But none of them actually do justice to what's actually there. If you, you know, actually get in the car and go on the road, or better yet, walk and start seeing all the details, you can't get that from a map. So you know, all these things are just... You know, don't take them too too seriously. They're just kind of suggestions of possibilities. That's right, because um, you know you can tell by people's questions what the, there are some. What I was going to say, you no, know, there's some similarities. There's definitely quite a lot of similarities. You can tell by you know the kind of questions that people are asking of themselves and asking when they're right to you. Um, because of, of course, at first, you know, we don't see all the traps that the mind or all that thoughts can play. We don't see them. They, they, they can creep up on you from behind. I often say, I- imagine that you're rich enough to employ a butler, and you em- you employ the butler to bring you the letters and the bills every day. And he comes up with a silver tray and says, "Here you are, madam or sir," and, and there you are. There's the butler. There's all the things on the tray. But every so often, because that butler. Uh, he doesn't like you very much. He's a bit sneaky, and uh, you, he thinks you don't pay him enough. So every so often, he'll just creep up at you from behind, and suddenly just get the train, go turn it over, and all the thoughts, all the letters, they all, they all, they all, you know, hey, hey what are you doing? What are you doing? I didn't employ you to do that. And he says, get stuffed or something. <laughs> and <laughs> and it's time to get out. a new butler. But <laughs> yeah, it's time to get a new butler. And that's what happens with the mind. You know, if you try and control it. You know, you won't get very far with trying to control it because it'll creep up behind and just drop more yeah. rubbish on your but, head. But but why did you bring up this idea based upon what we were talking about? I've no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, oh, I, I, used to, I know. I know where we were. We were okay. on sort of stages and traps of the mind. I see. And that's why I meant to say that. That so so if we, the more that we understand about the tricks that the mind can play, the more that we sort of can let it go and are ready for it. The more be it's about the more awareness we have. Awareness means being aware. So that instead of just looking in front of you, th- there's an awareness of what's to the side of you, what's above you, what's below you, what's behind you. This your state of awareness is what deepens uh, that which you are aware of. Source that doesn't change. But the degree of your awareness, that gets wider and, and, and 
and and bigger and whiter and lighter. Do you know what sure, I mean? Sure, yeah. That's, that's what the growing is, and that's why you can never say, oh, it's all over. God no. forbid you said it's all over. You know, I'd be very sorry for you because, you know, that's when people, there's a deadness, and I've stayed with enough of them. I mean, they've stayed with me for me to know that. And, yeah. and uh, Well, you can say that, but it's not going to last you that long. I mean, it, it, eventually you're going to say, well, I was wrong. It wasn't all over. Uh, yeah. keep, on, keep on trucking. Yeah. But, you know, this thing about stages. <laughs> like huh? me. Like well, me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. Um, and this whole thing about stages, um, just I think the mistake people make is they try to fit themselves into somebody else's roadmap. I remember the first time I took LSD back in the 60s. We sat around all night reading this book by Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, who later, later became Ramdas, trying to figure out what bardo we were in. You know, we were reading about all these bardos. And, you know, well, maybe we're in this bardo. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this this happens in a you know more serious way with... Pardon? Oh, did you, oh it's it's based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It was some some levels of you know oh, stage yeah. stages you go through or something, yeah. and uh, but I see that a lot where people have a certain roadmap that they've gotten really used to. You know maybe their it's their te their particular teacher's roadmap of you know what the stages of development are going to be, and then they they kind of their experience doesn't as it grow as it matures doesn't match the their conception of that roadmap and so they actually could have gone quite far through that roadmap or even gone beyond it and yet feel that they're not even starting out on it yet they haven't even reached the first you know stage that they had been anticipating so anyway you know what i'm trying to say and that's depressing because what if you think you've either skipped a stage or you and, you, and you, does that mean you have to go back? Oh my goodness, I've skipped <laughs> right. a stage, you know. Um, if there were stages, you know, some people reach them at different times, don't they? Or, or, Very differently, yeah, and in different yeah. orders and so on. Mm. So, I mean, if we can draw some grand conclusion from all this, it's just that, you know, as we were saying earlier, at least you and I seem to agree, maybe not everyone will, that this that it's an ongoing journey and um, I don't know if there's any clear consensus about what the landmarks on that journey are going to be but nonetheless it's a it's a fascinating we're all kind of like in a sense we're all like you know you, you, you might think geez it really would have been fun to live back in the 1800s and to have explored the western United States for the first time you know now it's all kind of developed and there's highways but in this journey that we're talking about it's, it's almost like we're all explorers exploring it for the first time because it's in somebody else's account of it is not uh, going to satisfy anybody and and so for us it's a it, every stay every step of the way is a, a fresh um, discovery oh pardon yeah, <laughs> your your can you audio. Still hear me? I, I can now. You cut out there for a minute, oh, so I, right. I haven't. Yeah. Go ahead. If you if yeah. you were just saying something, please say it again. I was listening to what you say. I, I think um, that what um, ch what happens is that I think the maturing of this is you, you see basically that the reason, the reason I think you can't say it's all over is what can be kind of all over is that um, certainly that identifying with a personality thinking that you are your thoughts um, all that that can go but you see it's it's too simplistic to say that because that which has built you up to think that you are a you there's lots to it and there's many many different shades of it and it's and as well as the big things like your memories all oh, right you're not your memories you're not your thoughts you're not your judgments and everything and then stuff comes up moment by moment and you see you're not that and that starts to be dissolved as there's an ever growing presence but however that there's there's more ref like you're saying about refinement there's more subtle things that can can come in that you you haven't seen before there's other things i mean th this is the freshness of life and and this is why you can't ever say that it's completely you know all over and you wouldn't want to either because that that that's a lack of aliveness so those that's i think that's what we're saying you know yeah, yeah. um and i think if people could 
you know, let's just speaking hypothetically, these people who are saying it's all over, if they could step into the shoes of, you know, s acknowledging that there are sort of that there is a vast range of possibility yet to be explored, if they could step into the shoes of someone who had, you know, um, traversed most of that a great deal of that range, they would be utterly flabbergasted at mm -hmm. the 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 kind of the depth and richness and detail of the experience. They, they just hadn't realized that there was such a possibility. Yeah, and, and there was, there's somebody, who, a very famous speaker, and, um, you know, uh, a, a one of these that says it's all over. Now, I've spent time with this person, and there is the most absolutely undeniable light there. There's no question about it, and, and, a, and a huge sense when you, with that person of really complete emptiness. But alongside of that, there's something that doesn't feel like love. That there really is, and, and I remember being interested in that, very deeply interested that how this can be going on at the same time. There seems to be this incredible open emptiness, but because somehow there's still some arrogance mixed in it, so there is something there, although there also isn't it's very hard it's not so you get into territories here that's just not black and white there was something that was not of love and something that felt a bit if you like small minded and mean going on at the same time mm -hmm. uh, and, and I just thought well that can only come from really closing up a portal which which happens if you think that everything's all over and that's it because if that was really really the case what would you be doing still walking this earth you know mm -hmm. so there's still you know it it's um, the, the the freedom the freedom is what i was after the freedom is what everybody can have and and the freedom um i i would say is what i feel that uh, I have to a, a very a good, great degree now compared to how how it was because I've, I've spent a lot of time looking, you know, put that yeah. effort in. Uh, however, there, there's no way that I could ever say oh, that's it, it's over, that that's it, me finished, done. <laughs> no, no way, and, I, and and I'm so glad because I wouldn't have been glad a few years ago. I, I wanted to know it was all over, you know, uh, but now it seems the, the opposite's true, and, and you know, nothing's over. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, um, just what you were saying about that person, whom I think I know who you're referring to, I think I've interviewed this person, but, um, and you saying you mentioned love, there seemed to be a lack of love, just take that as a case in point, uh, you know, interfreedism is, is established, okay, fine. But to what extent can love be developed? You know, to what extent can the heart be refined and expanded? Or take another example: to what extent can perception be refined? How 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 subtly, how richly can we appreciate through our senses the the creation? You know, that, that's around us. And you know, whether or not either of those developments takes place, the heart or the or the, the perception, find the inner freedom can be there. But um, yeah, and once the but once the inner freedom is established, I would suggest that the next frontier is this development of the in the relative. You know, the the development of of the heart, of perception, of well, perhaps numerous faculties that uh, are pretty much stunted and undeveloped in the average person that can actually begin to develop significantly on the basis of that freedom. Once I think it, once it dawns. I think there's a deep, uh, th there never stops being a deepening of love. It's the, the seeing of it because it's so expansive. There aren't even words, like, even words like expansive is just, uh, you know, it's just too small. So, so there's an ever, uh, an ever deepening wonder of that love. And, mm -hmm. and, and it keeps on kicking more barriers away and kicking more barriers away. And, and every day there's a bigger expansion of the, of, of, of the feeling of it, not by anybody. We don't want to go into that. It's just the feeling of it. It's the, it's that, it's just that sense of it. And and you can never come to the end of that. And I think in the end, that's why. Really glad you brought that up because that's why it can't ever be over. Because because there's that that love. It it just and it keeps taking you by surprise. Mm -hmm. I mean, even today, now I was just 
sitting, what just in the uh, just looking at the garden actually. And it wasn't uh, no, it wasn't down to something like oh there was a lovely birdie in the garden. There was a lovely birdie in the garden, but it wasn't about that. It was just something else, another kind of as though something else just got opened again and opened again. And and I love that going on. That that's lovely. Yeah. I don't think there can be an end to that. You know, I'm sure of it. And and you can feel it from people who really are feeling it you know what I mean there's not a feeling along with it of something that's you know arrogant or or, or there's no sense of arrogance with it or how could there be it's the, the opposite of that so that's when where I was surprised when I've met one or two of these people where yes there, there seems to be this light and this openness but along with it there's something that's not quite wholesome as well <laughs> I can't, yeah. quite, can't quite put my finger on it <laughs> so I don't, I don't want to do that comparing I don't, that's why I don't mention names although this no no I wouldn't want to mention names, names yeah. <laughs> no 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 yeah <laughs> Um, Ken Wilber talks a lot about this kind of thing. He's an American philosopher. Just mentioned today. <laughs> I was joking. I said you've just mentioned the name, but I'm only joking. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, his name. But I'm, I'm speaking in a complimentary way about him. He I talks know, about lines of development, and, and he says how you know there can be, and this, is, this idea isn't unique with him, but he expresses it well. Uh, one can be very developed along certain lines, say development of consciousness or inner freedom, but really quite immature in, uh, along other lines of development. And that, you know, true spirituality would probably mean uh, kind of a comprehensive development of all these lines, not just one to the exclusion of the others. And, and one other point I just want to throw in is, you know, a lot of times when you talk about spiritual stuff, and as we've been talking, um, it, it might almost seem a little hedonistic. It's all about sort of what my subjective experience is, how much bliss I have, how much freedom I have, how much you know inner joy and, and whatnot. Uh, but another dimension for growth, perhaps, that we could consider is of how much value am I to everyone else, you know, to the to the to the world, to the environment, and what is the kind of the range of possibilities of the development of that, you know. <laughs> I think that's answered more simply, though, because when when there isn't a sense of of, of a, a sort of a human me in that way, there's mm -hmm. there's room for everybody else. You know, there, there's space for everybody else. There's space for people to be a complete, you know, so and so, like that man that was driving the car, and 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 then people can feel that from you. Really, Muji says it's like a sort of a fragrance of peace that you give off it's a yeah. kind of a harmlessness you can be sat with somebody and um, you don't know them and they're a stranger and they feel it off you and and they feel better for it sure. they don't know what they don't know why and, and you, you're not doing anything mm -hmm. you you accept that you're not there so there's nothing there's no judgments going on is there there's nothing going on that you're an open space for that person that's that's the value that that there is in it yeah, we could say that the divine sort of radiates through you to a profound extent and, and influences that person positively. Oprah Winfrey has this thing which she says every morning, her, her prayer is, use me, you know, I, to, as if to God saying, just make me as effective an instrument as you can. And there's that <laughs> phrase from Sa that prayer of St. Francis, make me an instrument of your peace, you know. And a lot of people who have kind of, we would regard as saints or uh, highly spiritual people have that perspective that they are just instruments of the divine and, and they just want to serve the divine or be as as influential in a positive way as they possibly can be. They, they'd like that to be their function on earth. Yeah, that, that's it. That's right. And that thing, you know, use me, even if you don't feel that there's a you there, it's still something that you, you want to be used for the best purpose. You want to be an open channel for the best purpose, you know, mm -hmm. that everybody feels able to have that open sense of openness themselves that this sense of freedom we're talking about is it's the whole point is it's free it's available to everybody and you know i hope i've made that clear because that that, that used me was what what i thought before this interview you know i just sort of thought yeah i had i had that thought that yeah to be to be an open channel that um well the less there is a you there the more you can be used you know? Yeah, I mean, the more it. you're, the more you're kind of like, you know, trying to run the show, the less God can run the show. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Just get it, out, get out your own way. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, all right, well, that's delightful. I mean, you're the kind of person I could just kind of keep doing this with all day, and, and <laughs> I don't think we'd run, <laughs> run out of things to talk about, although we're, we're kind of going around the same points over and over, but it's good because we, we sort of get it from different angles, I think, each time we go around. Oh, it's been lovely to talk. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And you know what? I bet you if we do another one in a few years, you'll say, Boy, you know, I thought I had it all figured out three years ago <laughs> when I talked to you, and now there's like, I realize this, and there's so much more. <laughs> I think the difference is I don't feel I've got it figured out. It's right, like, good point. You know, <laughs> I did think that before. <laughs> yeah, well, I should. Yeah, I shouldn't. It's not fair to say it that way, but I bet you if we do have another I talk, and I, and I hope we will, you'll say, "Boy, it's gotten a lot even more interesting." You know. Oh uh, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's right. That's exactly what we were talking about, wasn't it? You exactly. Know, yeah. More things that you see. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's something that everyone has to look forward to. Um, it's, uh, you know, life is this fascinating adventure and it just keeps unfolding for us all. Yeah. Well, you know, because people, um, because I, I, I sort of offer Skype sessions, you see, one-to-one Skype sessions. Mm -hmm. And and I think these sessions, it, oh, I just had a little box that says, Scott Killaby's online. Isn't that funny? Yeah. I, I forget when you're on Skype that other people sort of pop up too. Yeah. Um, you know, and yeah, what was I saying? Oh, Skype conversations. You know, it's a lovely way of... of um, of, of meeting this isn't it you know if you, if you can't get to see somebody you can just do this I mean I, you, it feels very bonding doesn't it so it's, it's a lovely thing yeah. it does yeah I feel like I've got this big family all over the world now you know? yeah I bet you do Rick yeah <laughs> yeah fantastic it's great <laughs> it's very nice ready. part of it <laughs> oh yes yeah they're like yeah. my one of my British soul sisters oh <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> So I guess we better wrap it up. Um, I've been speaking with Mandy Sulk, who lives in the northern part of the UK. And uh, as she mentioned, she does Skype sessions. So if you'd like to get in touch with Mandy, I'll be linking to her website uh, from batgap.com, and you can contact her through that. And we want to say what your website is. I'll be linking to it, but what is it? It's mandysalk.com. Well, that's easy. M-A-N-D-I-S-O-L-K.com. And um, this interview has been one in an ongoing series. I do a new one each week. And if you'd like to listen to some of the previous ones, go to batgap.com and you'll see them all archived there. It's available both as video and as an audio podcast. So there's a link with each interview there to the I, I guess it's called iTunes uh, thing where you can subscribe to the podcast. Um, there's also a little discussion group that crops up around each interview. I noticed that last week's interview has 270 something comments now since uh, uh, just in a wow. week. So they get kind of lively. They usually go off topic, but I can't police it. So, you know, <laughs> I, I encourage people to try to stay relevant to the interview itself, but who knows? It doesn't matter. So uh, go there for that. And uh, what else? There's a donate button there. I appreciate people clicking on it. Um, and there's a little sign-up thing there. If you'd like to be notified by email each time a new interview is posted, just sign up and you will be. So good. So thanks, Mandy. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I, th I think next week is Caesar Terrell. I'll be speaking to him in Mexico. I'll be in Iowa. He'll be in Mexico. And wow. I, don't, um, I don't know much about Caesar yet, but a lot of people requested that I interview him, and he seems like an interesting guy. So that'll, that'll be next week. So thanks for listening or watching, and we'll see you then. <laughs>